From author Stephen Crane, to Heisman Trophy winner Ernie Davis, and astronaut Eileen Collins, Syracuse University has nurtured its share of outstanding achievers. For over a century, through war and peace, boom and depression, and at times nearly impossible odds, Syracuse University's can-do spirit has prevailed. We on the Hill like to feel that the same pioneering spirit that has helped us to flourish and to grow is still alive on campus. I'm Buzz Shaw, Chancellor, and I speak with pride for the whole Syracuse family in inviting you to share with us this presentation celebrating the history, events, and personalities that helped shape this great institution of higher learning. One of the hardest things to convey in writing history or uh, teaching history is that things didn't have to turn out the way they did. They didn't know that they were going to succeed. They didn't know that this great campus would exist here 125 years later. Uh, in fact, there was every reason to, to believe that it might fail. And we, uh, we walk around the campus and we see the buildings and the student body and all the excitement of the programs and the curriculum. We have to remember it started with a handful of students in a couple of rented rooms in a hotel downtown. Hardly auspicious. Uh, but um, uh, those people were willing to attempt something because they believed in it. It was co-educational education. It was, it was new and it was uh, ideally going to be open to all. And it was an act of faith, but the faith was the, fa the faith ran deep. I see in my mind's eye a great university on the hill. Instead of three colleges, I see a dozen colleges. Instead of several buildings, I see a, a student body of 8,000. I see this university, the center of the educational system of the state of New York. James Roscoe Day, Chancellor, 1894. It would be many years before the images of the Grand Army of the Republic veterans proudly marching in lockstep down flag-lined Salina Street would fade. Memories of the war were still vivid when a group of the Syracuse civic and religious leaders met in 1867 to discuss the establishment of a new university for the bustling commercial and industrial hub on the Erie Canal. To those who gathered that day, the city that Charles Dickens once said looked like it had been built yesterday, was an ideal location for this new educational enterprise. Local newspapers were quick to echo the sentiment. We maintain that the great need of Syracuse is a first-class institution of learning. The Daily Standard, March 20th, 1867. Members of the local citizenry who shared that vision would pledge their life savings to that end and within three years, their dream would become reality. On March 24, 1870, Syracuse University was chartered by the state of New York. 
and the very next year work began on the school's first permanent building, the Hall of Languages. Built of Onondaga limestone and located on 50 acres of high ground bucolically referred to as the Highlands, the lone gray, newly dedicated structure drifted serenely above the city like a three-masted schooner in the midst of a sea of hay, which was regularly harvested to augment the university budget of Chancellors Winchell and Haven. Visitors to Syracuse remarked the hill was more western prairie than campus. In those early years, after moving from a downtown location, university life was centered at the hall, home of the College of Liberal Arts. Replete with classrooms, laboratory, cafeteria, and central chapel, the school, with close ties with the Methodist Church, had a student body of 43, which included seven women. Tuition was $40, and half that price to sons and daughters of clergymen. In 1873, Syracuse became the first university in the country to grant a degree in fine arts under the school's first dean, George Fisk Comfort, one of the founders of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Amid the triumphs, there were also difficult times for the fledgling institution, as the Panic of 1873 swept the nation, leaving in its wake bankruptcy and financial ruin. As a result, an outgoing chancellor, Eurastus Haven, was purported to have told his successor, Charles Sims, in 1881, you cannot save the university, it must go. Sims ignored that gloomy piece of advice and through faith and perseverance brought the world-famous von Ranke Library to Syracuse, housed it, increased enrollment, and built Krauss College and Holden Observatory. This group of buildings, along with HL, is what is affectionately known as the Old Row. Perhaps Sims's greatest accomplishment was his assembling a strong faculty and three great college programs, liberal arts, fine arts, and medicine. In 1890, Orange was adopted as the official school color after the football and baseball teams complained of having to wear uniforms sporting the original colors of rose pink and pea green. In 1891, a young shortstop named Stephen Crane enrolled at Syracuse. He's not a scholarly student, but I believe his writings are the kind that will be long remembered. Charles Sims, Chancellor. Four years later, Crane would go on to write one of the great masterworks of American literature, The Red Badge of Courage. In those early days, there were no dormitories. Students were consigned to a boarding house or a fraternity or sorority. Some even commuted from home by horse and carriage. Athletics was an integral part of student life for both women and men. For less structured activity, there were the collegiate rites of passage known as the cane and salt rushes, pitting freshmen against sophomores. These spontaneous outpourings of student spirit, which threatened life and limb, would endure for more than 60 years, though temporarily discontinued in the early 90s in favor of the gentler sport of football. For the more cerebral, there was the Tambourine and Bones Drama Club, Tennis in Walnut Park, Debating Club, and the Onondagan. In 1893, Junius W. Stevens, a junior, would pen the university's alma mater to the tune of the old Irish heir, Annie Lyle. In 1894, Sims' successor, James Roscoe Day, was installed as chancellor, a position he would hold for 28 years. An articulate and imposing figure at six foot five, 250 pounds, the self-made Manhattan minister would leave a mark on the university as few before or since. A fearless champion of capitalism, Day boldly enlisted help from business giants like John D. Rockefeller, Jr. in advancing the cause of his beloved university. Day was a visionary and a builder, nicknamed the Iron Duke. Before his reign on the hill was over, enrollment would soar incredibly from 600 students to over 6,000. In the process, five new colleges and eight schools would be founded and 18 major buildings erected, including a library that he personally solicited from legendary steel magnate Andrew Carnegie, and the then largest concrete stadium in America, which Day obtained from close friend John Archibald, president of Standard Oil. Day's remarkable expansionist feats and zeal were not ignored by the national press. Famed novelist Upton Sinclair wrote about Day's obsession with growth. But there was far more to the complex and charismatic Day than even Sinclair could divine. A dynamic leader 
Day focused tremendous energy turning vision into reality and bringing the university into the 20th century. During Day's tenure, the colleges of engineering, law, and human development were founded, as were the schools of education, management, and information studies. Under Day, the university's programs in engineering and the sciences were greatly expanded, as L.C. Smith, Bowne, and Lyman Halls were built. A graduate school was also established on the Hill. The student newspaper, the Daily Orange, made its debut about this time, and the Boar's Head Dramatic Society began its 50-year run of noteworthy campus productions. On November 23, 1915, evangelist Billy Sunday and his wife Ma visited the campus to hold a revival. In a telegram, Sunday told Day, Hurrah for Syracuse University. I feel sure we'll carry the gospel ball through the devil's line for a touchdown. Billy Sunday. 2,500 students attended the tabernacle. Touchdowns aside, Day was a stern disciplinarian who railed against the forbidden evils of spirits and smoking. He was, however, not without a sense of humor. When the first phone was installed on campus, he lightheartedly cautioned students against using it to contact their sweethearts downtown. With the onset of World War I, Syracuse University and the War Department jointly developed a program allowing ROTC students to combine military and collegiate subjects, a national first and prototype of the modern programs of today. 2,000 men trained at Syracuse as army cots crammed every available cottage. The staid Winchell Hall was even transformed into a military barracks replete with mess hall. With the war, career plans are altered as Syracuse students and alumni answered the call. There were the inevitable sacrifices and many things would never be the same. Military and Red Cross classes were offered on campus and athletics were suspended. At the war's end, the campus, as well as the rest of the country, celebrated. It was at this time the university loosened its ties with the Methodist Church and amended its charter to define the institution as non-sectarian. During the early 20s, Syracuse attracted national attention as the city where passenger trains ran through the center of town. Post-war enrollment swelled as the railroad frequently brought returning servicemen from all over the country in search of an education. The 20s also brought flappers, jazz, prohibition, rumble seats, freshman beanies, bobbed hair, and a new chancellor, Charles Wesley Flint. During Flint's administration, academic standards were raised and the School of Journalism and the Maxwell School of Citizenship were founded. Dubbed the Phantom Chancellor for his predilection for fundraising that frequently took him away from campus, his intelligent management brought the university safely through a depression and the most difficult of times. Flint encouraged self-government by the students and was outspoken in his views of quotas and freedom of speech. The best place of preparation for leadership is not in the segregated, isolated, cloistered group of the elect few, but rather in the organization which more nearly approximates the conditions of the outside world. Charles Wesley Flint, Chancellor. Like his predecessor, Flint was a sound disciplinarian and quick to perceive the pitfalls of too much revelry among the student body, limiting campus living centers to two dances each year. Of course, Syracuse's students still managed to have fun. There was the Halloween romp at the university farm, the Greek review, sorority and fraternity dances, classical club, and many, many extracurricular activities. Homecoming weekend with its parades and activities routinely attracted thousands of alumni and students. Probably the premier event of the school year at Syracuse from a student's perspective was moving up day. This celebration, which derived its name from each class graduating or moving up in the chapel to inherit the seats of the preceding class. Many a student's social life was centered around the university's sporting events, and in particular, football weekends. Noteworthy were the hard-fought contests against Colgate and Old Archibald that drew full houses. In those days, co-eds sat on opposite sides of the stadium from the men, 
and this led to the curious form of expression known as cross-cheering. In an association that would last nearly five decades, the Saltine Warrior made his appearance on the sidelines about this time as the university's mascot. After the game, a stop at Marshall Street for a Virginia special or a milkshake was a natural. To many, extracurricular activities provided a welcome complement to the challenges of earning an education. Academic standards at the university were steadily rising, and to ensure success, Syracuse students had to apply themselves to a fairly rigorous study program. Because of the economic uncertainties of the times, many students held outside jobs to help defray costs of tuition, books, and lodging. Internationally, the Syracuse and China program was at the peak of its mission, bringing much-needed medical and educational resources to the Far East. At his baccalaureate address, Flint sent the class of 1935 out into the world by paraphrasing Browning. My last official word to you is, whatever your world assignment, whatever else you may or must do, stand erect, catch at God's skirts, pray. Charles Wesley Flint. Dr. William Graham assumed the chancellorship in 1936. A scholarly and personable man, the sixth chancellor of Syracuse University and his wife would frequently open their home to receptions for the students. One of Graham's first acts was to announce the construction of the Maxwell School of Citizenship. Herbert Hoover was on hand to dedicate the new structure. That same year, President Franklin Roosevelt laid the cornerstone for the university's medical center, which would later become the SUNY Health Sciences Center. In 1937, over 600 freshmen registered for courses, an all-time record. Coed sought permission to wear slacks, and the Daily Orange was headed by Betty Donnelly, one of the first female collegiate editors in America. At the close of the decade, the basement of Slocum Hall is turned into a non-alcoholic nightclub for students called, appropriately enough, Club Sahara. Over the campus radio station, WSYU, scores of university-produced programs were being aired nightly. Dramatics similarly came to the fore with legendary department chairman Sawyer Falk directing many outstanding Broadway-level productions through the Boar's Head, a student drama society. But in the background of student life and activity were ominous reports from across the Atlantic. War came to Europe in 1939, and the Roosevelt administration began to draft young men for military service in the fall of 1940. In the spring, 700 male SU students would be inducted into the armed forces. The following year, admissions dropped dramatically. In the fall of 1942, Graham would step down and be replaced by the then president of Drew University, William Pearson Tully. William Pearson Tolley, a member of the class of 1922, became chancellor in 1942. Under his leadership and 27-year tenure, the university would endure the hardships of war and enjoy the fruits of peace to prosper and grow. Shortly after assuming his duties, Tolley went to Washington and was instrumental in having Syracuse establish a war service college, one of the first of its kind to offer pre-induction training to students. Fraternities closed, and varsity sports were discontinued as the university geared itself up to meet the awesome challenge of educating, feeding, and housing our servicemen. Everyone in the Syracuse community pulled together, as the university was home to the largest contingent of Air Corps men in the United States. After making a significant contribution to the country's war effort, and receiving the admiration of then-President of the United States, Harry Truman, the armistice provided Syracuse's can-do spirit with another test. How to meet the educational demands of thousands of servicemen returning from war who would be seeking a college education under the GI Bill. Again, the university rose to the challenge. Quonset huts, prefabs, and other temporary classroom space sprung up all over campus. Overcrowding was the order of the day, but so was cooperation with every available space on campus put to maximum use. As scores of servicemen passed through Syracuse to go on to lead productive lives, slowly yet inevitably, the university returned to a more normal state of affairs. 
A goon squad was started to welcome an Orient freshman to the traditions of campus. New permanent student housing was erected on Mount Olympus, and Floyd Ben Schwartzwalder was named head football coach of a team that had suspended its efforts for the duration. The 50s, by and large, proved to be an era of peaceful growth for the university. Programs were improved and admissions stabilized. Tali strove to improve the caliber of the university's faculty by bringing in the best and the brightest of instructors. During Tali's tenure, the colleges of nursing, architecture, and social work were founded, and the university was accepted for membership in the prestigious American Association of Universities. Throughout this period, cherished traditions like moving up day, homecoming at its gala parades, step singing, the lantern ceremony, winter carnival, and pageants were kept alive. It was a time of bobby socks and malted milkshakes, football weekends, freshman beanies, cottage living, Thorndon Park, Green Lakes, strolls on the quad, and school spirit. It was a harmonious time, an era when Tolly's name and Syracuse University were synonymous. In 1959, the football team defeated Texas in the Cotton Bowl for the national championship. One of the stars of that team, Ernie Davis, later went on to win the Heisman Trophy. In September 1961, Dr. Martin Luther King addressed more than 700 students on campus, and freshman enrollment stood at 3,300, the largest class of the post-World War II era. Again, space was at a premium. Fortuitously, Chancellor Tully, like an earlier predecessor, James Day, was a builder. Under his leadership, the university entered into a building program that was unparalleled in its long history. Much-needed dormitories such as Del Plain and Haven Hall were constructed. Manley Fieldhouse and Huntington Krauss were also added. Under Tolley's direction, the Maxwell School and graduate levels were expanded, and the Newhouse Communications Center, a gift of publishing magnet SI Newhouse, was dedicated by then-President Lyndon Johnson as home for the journalism school and communications disciplines. To replace the much-loved Yates Castle, Syracuse University became the first university in the country to offer a degree in mass communications, the first to offer a television curriculum, the first with a major department of special education, and remained on the cutting edge of major colleges, instituting many innovative new programs. Tali, according to one of his associates, wanted the university to be internationally known, and he was here at precisely the right time in SU history. During the 60s, crew cuts were the order of the day. Students let off steam in huge water fights and by twisting at the numerous sock hops that were held around campus. There were dress codes and curfews. In 1966, Dave Bing led the basketball team to its first appearance in an NCAA tournament. Towards the close of the decade, the calm and harmony that had marked the 50s was supplanted by the unrest and protest that filled most of the college campuses in America at that time civil rights, Vietnam, the women's movement, and student autonomy were all issues foremost on the minds of students in the late 60s and early 70s. Tolly retired in 1969. His replacement, John Corbley, held the position for a year and a half, and in 1971, Melvin Eggers became the ninth chancellor of Syracuse University. In 1971, Melvin Eggers, a soft-spoken economics professor from the university's Maxwell School, was named chancellor. Under Eggers, Syracuse would maintain its reputation as a world-class institution of higher learning. Eggers was a consensus builder who, like predecessor Charles Wesley Flint, turned inherited financial problems around with his decisive positive outlook. As chancellor, Eggers managed to add valuable new programs faculty and resources while keeping the university on sound financial footing. Eggers was a builder. The Science and Technology Center, Heroy Geological Laboratory, Krauss Heinz School of Management Building, Barclay Law Library, Archibald Theater, and Newhouse Communications Center II were all constructed during his tenure. In 1978, the venerable Archibald Stadium would come down. Two years later, Edgars would cut the ribbon on its replacement, the 50,000-seat carrier dome, new home to the football and basketball teams. 
Under Edgar's, the Greenberg and Lubin houses were established in Washington and New York, giving the university an important presence for alumni and recruiting in the two power centers. In the 80s, fresh thinking was shown in the Gateway, Soling, and Mellon programs. The university's involvement in the Sears and Lilly projects, along with the creation of new chairs and teaching positions, lent additional support to academic programs. In 1983, the university hosted its first Coming Back Together reunion, welcoming more than 200 returning African-American and Latino alumni. That same year, SU junior Vanessa Williams became the first African-American to be named Miss America. Two years later, a generation's old dream was realized with the completion of the Hildegard and J. Meyer Shine Student Center. With 10,000 visitors per day, the center serves as a focal point for student life. Construction of the Schaefer Art Building, Flanagan Gymnasium, and Goldstein Student Center followed Shine and offer much needed and improved facilities to students. In 1987, the men's basketball team reached the finals of the NCAA tournament and that same year, the football team capped a perfect season with a trip to the Sugar Bowl. With pride in the university and its programs at a high, sadly the next year, one event stunned the entire world. 35 students in the university's Division of International Programs Abroad returning home from overseas study were killed by a terrorist bomb over Lockerbie, Scotland. A memorial in front of the Hall of Languages and 35 scholarships were established in their honor. In 1990, the last of the remaining Quonset structures that dominated the university's landscape during the post-war Kandu boom years was demolished. A jubilant Melvin Eggers is present, riding on the sideboard of a bulldozer. It is the end of an era. In 1991, Kenneth A. Shaw, former president of the University of Wisconsin System, became the 10th chancellor of Syracuse University. Since his arrival, he has implemented planning and resources targeted on helping to make Syracuse University the leading student-centered research university in the country. Shaw's vision of top quality undergraduate education reflects his belief in the university's five core values of quality, caring, diversity, innovation, and service. Much of Syracuse University's greatness comes from its constant striving to improve, to improve in everything it does, but most important, our actions are tied to our core values, and our actions embrace and reinforce those values. Chancellor Shaw has also made the university more responsive to changes in national demographics through a restructuring program. This series of carefully thought out strategic cuts will help Syracuse meet the challenges of the fast approaching 21st century. During the 90s, Syracuse strengthened its commitment to international understanding and learning through the university's Division of International Programs, with over 2,000 students a year choosing to study across the Atlantic or Pacific. Recruitment of international students has also become a priority, with a diverse group of over 2,000 students at Syracuse representing more than 100 countries. This international exchange of knowledge and ideas has been enhanced with the opening of the Maxwell School's Eggers Hall, which houses the Global Affairs Institute and the International Exploratorium. The Exploratorium is a high-tech multimedia communication center that links the university to the world. Great teaching has always been central to Syracuse University's mission, as have the graduate and continuing education programs, which have been part of the university for more than 75 years. Shaw has also been a driving force in establishing SUIQ, a university-wide training program in total quality management designed to help staff and faculty perform and interact more effectively. It is during Chancellor Shaw's tenure that perhaps one of the most exciting chapters in the Syracuse story will be written. As the university is poised at the beginning of its new campaign to help maintain Syracuse's position as a national leader in quality higher education, Resources are being put in place that a few short years ago would have been unimaginable. Syracuse students and faculty are engaged in research in the humanities and sciences that is advanced even by today's standards. There is, after all, a sense of mission and purpose on the Hill that is reminiscent of those early pioneering years. It is a thread, a common bond that students, alumni, and those associated with Syracuse University past and present share. This continuity and oneness with an experience 
the gift of learning, has its roots deeply planted in a dream that began over a century ago atop a hill overlooking the Vale of Onondaga. It is a legacy of learning, service, and accomplishment that has endured through war and peace and has grown to span the world. For students, alumni, and faculty contemplating new chapters of the Syracuse story, the best may be yet to come. Perhaps Chancellor Emeritus William Pearson Tolley best captured the essence of learning and adventure that has been central to the Syracuse experience for over a century and a quarter. He said, If we believe in miracles, it is because we see so many before our eyes. If we believe in dreams, it is because so many of them come true. We are believers in the art of becoming, which is what education is. We have a direct experience of witnessing and sharing the limitless growth of the human mind and spirit. If we believe in dreams, it is because so many of them come true. Those words by Chancellor Emeritus William P. Tolley are an eloquent summation of Syracuse University's first 125 years as chair of the Board of Trustees. I am privileged to serve our university as our dreams for the next century are being formed, and I am certain that with your help, those dreams as well will come true. Mm -hmm.